game. Okay, we're getting to it now. Jeffrey Phillips from Liège, Belgium, designed this. Belgium's chapter chose the theme game. And there's like a person playing an iPad and like tennis or, or badminton. Yeah, I know games. <laughs> and then look at this last one. It's like romance? <laughs> Jeffrey? Come on. Um, we decided not to go down the, the love is a game route, as fun as that would be. Uh, and is, are talking about traditional gaming today. And we're really lucky to have Jared Huntley here. Um, her, he's, since we first, I heard, first heard about him, he's part of like the gaming development community. I was like, oh yeah, he's pretty cool. And then consistently over the past months and months and months, I'm like, dude's doing some stuff. All right, and he was recently, uh, the game that he published, which is uh, Art Club Challenge, was featured in the Smithsonian for like a piece about arcades, and it's just really cool. I'll let him tell you about it, and uh, let him take the stage. Jared Huntley, please come up and, uh, and help us out. Good to have you here. Good morning, everyone. Morning. How's everyone doing? Good. Yeah, so I had no idea that my face was gonna, my face and name was gonna be printed on the material, so that's a new experience for me, just walking in and seeing my name everywhere, so I don't know. I thought it was kind of cool. All right, so um, I'm really excited to be here. Like Thomas mentioned, um, I'm Jared Huntley. I'm a local game developer. Um, I'm also uh, a game programmer, that's primarily how I work on games, and I'm also an educator. So I teach game development at Lorain County Community College. All right, things are displaying. So um, I want to talk a little bit about communication. I want to talk about how game design can be a useful tool, not just for game developers, but for everyone. Um, one of the things I like to talk about with uh, game development and when I'm talking with people who aren't familiar with it is talking about some of the skills we learn as game developers and how we can apply them to the broader world. So I want to throw out an example. Um, would anyone question a comic artist doing a magazine cover? I don't really think so. Would anyone question someone who does, does line drawings um, to do an illustration for a book? Probably not. But what about a game designer to help with your marketing campaign? That's where people are like, well, probably because you're up here talking about video games, uh, you probably have some point. Yes, that's true. But um, that connection from game development to an unrelated field isn't something that a lot of people are familiar with. And that's kind of what I want to uh, talk about with everyone here today. Um, so why I specifically mention comics and um, line drawing is comics were originally not seen as an art form. Drawing was considered valueless at one point. It was considered only a means to block out paintings. They were considered worthless. Um, I think we're at the point where game development is starting to um, become a broader field and we're starting to um, be able to figure out how it can relate to other types of uh, interaction, other design fields, and just the broader world and culture. All right, so before we start, let's define something. What is a game? So we'll do a little bit of audience participation. I'll take maybe two or three um, guesses. Whatever definition you feel like, what do some people feel like a game is? All right, right. Challenge. A challenge. Something you play. Something you play. Maybe you have a lady. Cool. It has rules. Has rules. All right, those are all awesome definitions. My definition is, I don't actually know. Um, so this is something that all game developers have their own kind of uh, ideas, their, their own um, takes on what they define a game as. Uh, one of the definitions to games that I like um, is stylized human interaction. Um, but one of the things that all definitions of games um, have to come back to is this thing called agency. One of the defi definitions of agency is an action um, or um, intervention, especially such to produce a particular effect. And all games have agency. 
That means that you're able to affect change. You're able to change the destiny. You're able to change the outcome. No matter what type of game, whether it's a board game, whether it's hopscotch, whether it's um, the newest Call of Duty game. And something interesting about agency is you might see the newest Call of Duty game and think, you know, oh, that's, you know, this big spectacular game, you know, there's explosions and things, you know, you might want to relate it to a Michael Bay movie or something like that. But in reality, because of that thing, agency, Call of Duty has more in common with T-Ball than it does with the next Hollywood thriller, agency. So who are gamers? I want to talk about games and, and who plays them for a little bit because when you hear the word gamer, oftentimes people have a specific idea that comes to mind. Uh, they might think of you know, Mountain Dew and Doritos and maybe a basement somewhere. Um, <laughs> they might think of you know, professional gamers you know, that train for 12, 14, 16 hours a day. Um, and they might not think of themselves. Oftentimes when you know, I give talks and I ask you know, who consider themselves gamers, um, not that many people put their hands up. And I'll ask, well, who plays Candy Crush? Who plays Farmville? Who plays Fortnite? And you know, nearly everybody will have their hands up. You don't have to play the newest you know, Xbox game to be a gamer. And one of the things about games is that they're really a part of culture. They're really a part of who we are as human beings. So some facts about gamers. Um, these are from a, uh, a survey in 2014, and I know the numbers have shifted a little bit, but these are still pretty relevant. The average age of, the ga of a, a gamer is 35 years old. 48% um, of um, gamers are female, and 20, uh, or 52% are male. Um, I want to say it might have crossed over the 50% uh, threshold with female to male recently. Um, also, 27% of gamers are under 18, and 26% of gamers are over 50. A lot of people don't realize there's as many people playing games over 50 as there are under 18. And so I wanted to throw those out to kind of change um, your perception on games. And also, so we spoke about you know, Candy Crush and Farmville and things like that other types of games that people play. So I was at a conference um, two weeks ago. Um, it was a conference on uh, uh, data and open data and things like that. I was sitting behind a gentleman. He had you know, a three-piece suit on, you know, dressed up very nice. Um, we had just finished lunch, and he crumpled up his napkin. And you know, there was a speaker going on, but he crumpled up his napkin, and there was a trash can over in the side of the corner. And real discreetly, he just kind of went like that. It landed in the trash can and, you know, pumped his fist and everything. Those are games as well. And we do those types of things all day. I mean, how many times do you still play, you know, don't step on the crack as you're walking down the sidewalk? Um, you know, you try to finish your meal faster than someone else. Those are all types of games. And they're so ingrained into culture, into language, into what we do, we don't even consider them games. But those are the types of experiences we can use to make things more engaging. Those are the types of experiences that don't have a language. Those are the types of experiences that we can use to connect with people in different ways. So I have a video, a couple of videos I want to play. Let's see if I can do this. Nope, nope. Which one? Chrome. Chrome. All right, cool. I don't think it has sound, but I think you'll get the point. Just imagine some peppy music here.
All right. Um, it was about 10%. I want to say uh, at the end of the video, they give the stats. I want to say it was like 1,500 people um, walked by and about 120 or something like that played the game. Um, so it was about 10%. But um, I really love that video. One, just because you just see people, you know, just kind of light up and play games, you know, just playing hopscotch, you know. It uh, doesn't matter if they're old or young. You can see them engaging with that. Um, and the interesting thing is, one, that... It doesn't matter if somebody's watching or not, they're still engaging with that game. And two, um, it doesn't matter how old they are, how young they are, uh, they're still getting that same enjoyment out of that experience. All right, next I want to talk about communication. So a definition of communication um, is the imparting or exchanging information or news, or another definition is means of connection between people or places in particular. Communication, it's something we do all day. It's something we do every day. And there's different types of communication. There's verbal communication. There's the communication that happens with your body language, your stance, your attitude, your mannerisms. And then there's communication that happens um, um, through other means, whether it be text messages, whether it be video conferencing. Games use a lot of those same communications uh, methods because it's a conversation. One way I like to think about games is a conversation between the game developer or the game creator and the player. It's a constant conversation because there's back and forth because of that word we spoke about, agency. When you watch a movie, it's almost like a one-way experience. You're absorbing, you're consuming that experience. But with the game, you're engaging with it you're giving something back and you're getting something different back. And that's one of the things that makes games different. Um, some of the ways that games can help with communication, uh, there was a study last year that was published in Computers and Education that showed that games can help with communication skills. They studied a number of individuals that were playing um, games that required cooperation. They studied them before and after. The people who played games engaged better in conversations, they're able to communicate more effectively, com communicate better. Um, but there's other types of things that I think we can gain from communicating through games and learning about how games communicate. The practice of game design, like I mentioned, is communicating with the player. The important thing is that a game designer isn't there. A game designer isn't, you know, unless it's at, you know, a trade show and whatnot, and we all try not to stand over someone's shoulder and say, oh, you're supposed to play like this or something <laughs> like that. Um, but when you release a game, you're not there engaging with the person. So that communication is happening through the experience. We have a lot of different tools in game development that we can use to communicate with someone. And we're communicating not with somebody through a static experience like a film. We're communicating with an individual that has agency. And so we have to think about how that individual might engage with the experience, how that individual might go one way versus another way, how that individual might react to different things that are happening. So I want to talk about a few of the tools that we have as game developers when we use, uh, that we can use to communicate, that we can use to engage players. One of the core experiences, or I should have used another word than core, but one of the um, uh, important experiences, um, parts of making a game is something called the core loop. The core loop is that engagement cycle. There's different types of engagement cycles in different types of games, but they oftentimes act like we have a instance of high focus where we're trying to pay attention to something and then there's just this kind of, you know, you get past something, it kind of relaxes and then you re-engage with it. If you just had a game that was constant engagement, it would be very stressful, you know, you wouldn't um, be able to relax. And so, um, you know, in board games, sometimes that's taking turns. In Mario, you know, each time you lose a life, you come back. But inside those larger core loops, there's smaller core loops. So I want to play another game. And this game is fairly goofy. When we talk about games, sometimes they get 
pretty ridiculous. So if you're familiar with it, it's a game called Splatoon 2. Um, but basic, you're, basically, you're these characters called Squid Kids. Um, and you're trying to cover the level in the most paint possible. Uh, when you run out of paint, you turn into a squid, and you swim around, you pick up more paint, and then you can take, you know, cover the level more. Yes, it's as ridiculous as it sounds. <laughs> but um, I like to show it because I think it illustrates um, these different core loops fairly well. So let's pick right here. So the squid kid is going around covering the level in paint. Once they run out of paint, they have to turn back into a squid. So that's one of those core loops. If they get taken out by one of their enemies, they'll lose a life, go back to the spawn point, and they'll have to take another turn. So that's a larger core loop. So oftentimes you have you know, maybe a large core loop that's individual levels. You have smaller core loops that are maybe the lives that you have. You have smaller core loops in this um, uh, where you know once you run out of paint, you need to recharge by turning into squid. So here, you know, um, that character lost, and so you have to respawn. You get to go back. So those are different types of core loops in this game. The important thing there is that um, you want to think about that engagement cycle not as just constant engagement. You want to think about it, you know, high action, high engagement, settle down, high action, high engagement, so on and so forth. So some other tools that we have are rewards. And there's two main types of rewards. rewards. There's intrinsic rewards and extrinsic rewards. Extrinsic rewards are typically what we think about in games as getting a high score, getting more points, getting uh, coins, things like that. Things that are represented by a number, by a level, things uh, that we can collect. Intrinsic rewards are a little bit harder to design for, but they're a lot more satisfying. Intrinsic rewards are the player actually getting better, the player understanding how to approach skills um, um, with new knowledge. So that might be bosses getting harder, and that might be uh, the game not adjusting to make itself easier, but the player realizing that they've become more skilled through playing a game. Maybe playing Sudo uh, Sudokus makes you better at math, or playing a crossword puzzle uh, helps you with your, your English and grammar. But there's also dark sides of, of designing games. There's a responsibility there. If anybody's been following the news, you might have heard about something called loot boxes. There's a lot of controversy about them because um, um, they share a lot of similarities with, with gambling. And people, um, a lot of companies have used them, maybe not in the best ways because they have high engagement. They have, um, they have a lot of the, the same qualities as maybe a slot machine. So there's responsibility along with that. And along with that, one thing I always like to add out there is not everything should be a game. There's some types of experiences that shouldn't be gamified. As Thomas mentioned, you know, maybe not you know, love and romance and life and everything like that um, should be considered a game. Um, but game-like elements can be added to a lot of different things. So what are some examples that I, um, I like to point to? So one is something called gamification. That's adding game-like qualities to different types of experiences. If you've been to a restaurant or a coffee shop and you've had a rewards card, that's gamification. Um, if you think about the McDonald's, um, um, why can't I think of it? The um, Monopoly. Monopoly, yes. I could see the little dude with the top hat, but I couldn't <laughs> think of the name. Um, yeah, Monopoly, that's gamification. That's adding game-like elements to something that's not considered a game. Um, Sometimes in the industry, gamification has kind of a, a, um, you know, a bad reputation, but I think if you engage gamification and you don't just make a point system, it can be a really satisfying way to engage your audience. Um, playful design is also something that I think is an interesting way to involve your, your audience. 
Uh, playful design is adding playful and fun elements that don't necessarily have any tangible benefit other than being fun. So one of my uh, go-to examples is if you use Facebook Messenger, you have that button over in the corner where you can press the thumbs up. But if you hold that button, the thumbs up gets bigger. If you hold it, it gets bigger. And if you hold it too long, it explodes for no reason whatsoever. It just goes boop. Um, but that's playful design. It's adding a, a fun element. Um, you can almost think about it like we were speaking about with that core loop where if you hold it too long, it pops, and then you have to try it again because you want to try to get the biggest thumb without it exploding. Um, with happiness. Um, <laughs> um, but playful design is a way to engage your audience as well. And probably um, my weirdest example is, nope, not that one. Actually, no, we'll talk about my game first. Uh, so this is a game that I just released, Art Club Challenge. Um, I guess we can try the trailer for this, even though it doesn't have sound. Would you like to create some art with me? Okay, you're gonna do great. Make a little blue bird with a blue body, yellow legs, and a yellow beak. Oh, and let's add some seeds for her to eat. This is great. Now, share this with the world in our art gallery. Welcome to our humble art club. Complete challenges by creating art. And flex your creative muscles in a chill environment. Art Club Challenge. I don't think I've actually watched that without sound. It still works. <laughs> All right, so um, as I'm talking, I'll just give a demonstration of my game. So uh, it's a game that helps people learn how to make art through puzzles. So um, we have the black cat challenge. It says first make a head, a body, and a tail. The next one is make sure it has a red collar with a little uh, bell, and then make sure it has some pretty yellow eyes. So. I can just put in, you know, the body here. Let's give our cat a head. I'll try to do the rotate thing so people can see. Um, then we'll give our cat a tail. And the check mark popped up in the corner, letting the player know they passed that goal. Then we can go through each one of those challenges and complete them all. Once you have all three of those challenges completed, you can upload it to the gallery. But one of the things that I love about the, the game and that you know, me and the team um, kind of experience as we are designing the game is that intrinsic versus extrinsic design rule. So the extrinsic rewards are those little check boxes along the way. You met this goal, you met this goal, you met this goal, and then the little bell pops up in the corner saying, oh, you've completed it. But once people complete the challenge, they have the opportunity to continue to work with their art. And most players actually continue to add their, to their art. So even once they've met the goals for the game, they're finding enjoyment in making their art better. They're finding enjoyment in engaging with it more. And some people, I actually heard about one player who left the app running for like three days and kept on adding to a piece of art and it was just absolutely incredible. So that's kind of intrinsic and extrinsic rewards interplay. And so for my last example, and this is, this is the, the weird one, um, one of my favorite examples to talk about is the weirdest spam email I've ever received. Um, so um, when I was in high school, I set up a website that was animated comics, and along with it, I set up free email. So you know people could have email at you know, mywebsite.com. Unfortunately, whoever I hosted through was awful at stopping spam. So it was just like a spam magnet. But I got this one spam email and, you know, it was trying to get me to, I don't know, buy some type of stock or send somebody, you know, money in a far off country or something like that. Um, but at the bottom, there was a little bit of a story. And it was a bit of a story from what seemed like a crime thriller. There's, you know, um, a, a guy and then, you know, some, some woman comes to his office and she needs help finding somebody or something like that. And I was just like, 
what is this? Um, so I deleted it. But then a couple days later, I got another email, and it was a different part of that same story, but not sequential. It like happened earlier. And I was like, this is really weird. And then I got another spam email, and it was a different part of the story. But because the story was out of order, and because I was interested in it, I kept all this spam email. Um, so I had like 50 parts of this story that were <laughs> all out of order, and I was trying to like put together this narrative. Um, I don't know if it was intentional or not. I don't think it was, but it was a really engaging experience. And so thinking out of the box on how to engage people like that, um, or some of the ways that we can, um, um, we can help people as game developers. But the thing about that um, spam email is I gave a talk to a company uh, last year, and that was the example that I gave their R&D department on how to engage uh, customers better. I'm still trying to see if they pick up on that. So if you see random bits of a story on some type of product, maybe that was me. All right, so just kind of wrapping things up. Um, we talked about games, what games are. We spoke about uh, who plays games. We spoke about how do game developers engage people. So am I advocating that you know, everybody becomes game designers? No, actually, that would be super cool. Uh, everybody should become game, game designers. I selfishly want that. But no, I don't think everybody needs to become game designers to use game-like elements in their products, game-like elements in their, um, their events, game-like elements in how they interact with people. Um, even though game design is a separate field, you can think about working those types of elements into what you do. It's not odd to find a typography or a color theory book on a web developer or a marketer's desk. I would love it if people start including a game design book in that stack and not consider it something that they can engage with, not something that they do, but something that they can learn from and integrate into uh, their lives um, moving forward. Right, thank you. Awesome. Thank you.